Yeah, it's called Conversations with Jeff, not Screaming Matches. Yeah, yeah I, 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 you and I do not agree on Calvinism. But look how nice we are to each other. I think it's going to really shock a lot of people, thrill a lot of people. A lot of people are going to have to do some soul searching. It's like, you know what? What are you doing? You're spending all your time trying to destroy another Christian because you don't understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. When you should be out there winning people for Jesus. Right. Thank you for the job you're doing. Thanks for being willing to address these kind of issues. They're vital to the church. I feel sorry for what's coming your way, but God bless you, man. It's it's a good, healthy conversation, and, and let's keep growing together in the Lord. People won't change unless they hear the truth, though, and so we need to know the truth, uh, speak the truth, and then the last one I would say is that we need to stay in the truth, uh, no matter what the consequences are. Okay, everybody, welcome to uh, this week's episode of Conversations with Jeff. Uh, really excited to have uh, you all here. I'm really excited about today's podcast as well. Uh, before I introduce our guest, I uh, wanted to make a quick announcement just about the GK Podcast Network um, overall. We're adding a new podcast to the lineup called The Rucker Report. It's going to be hosted by J.D. Rucker from over at Knock Report. Uh, really excited to bring him on. He's going to be really covering a lot of the uh, the daily events and what their daily uh, topics, things that are going on in the news, really dive into politics. But everything will be coming from a Christian perspective, which will, which would be nice to be dealing with a lot of these issues from that perspective. So I'm really excited to have uh, JD joining the team here at the GK, come, going going along with uh, you know guys like uh, Schumann over at the Schumann Show, Battle, Battlefront Southgate here at Conversations with Jeff. So uh, and then within the next week or two, we're going to be announcing another podcast. We're going to be adding as well. Um, and then the other thing as well is, you know, we have our plugged in membership as well. Um, all of these podcasts after a week or two rolls into that. You're also going to have exclusive co- um, content with the Destroy Social Justice Conference that we did. That's going to be exclusively for members only as well. So you guys can head over to gatekeepersonline.com slash plugged in if you guys would like to get plugged in. Um, and I'm just really excited about that announcement, really excited about um, today's uh, podcast as well. Uh, we're bringing on Michael Scheuer um, onto the podcast, really excited to have him on. Uh, I mean, he's got a fascinating background, and I'm really excited to get his perspective on a lot of the things we're seeing uh, coming up. So welcome to the podcast, Michael. Glad we could sit down with you. Thank you, Jeff. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, and like one of the things that, you know, about kind of following along with your your story and your background is, I mean, like you've worked in the CIA, you dealt with, you know, tracking Osama bin Laden. I mean, you know, it, that's pretty crazy, you know, in the sense of from all of us, we're looking at it like, you know, you know, somebody's involved with one area or another area, but you were actually actively involved in a major piece of American history in tracking Osama bin Laden. I mean, how did you get to that point to where you're going after somebody of that magnitude? Well, I went to work at the agency in um, 1982. And for three years, I worked as a as an analyst. And after that, I went over to the Directorate of Operations, which handles our covert action around the world. And I worked on Afghanistan till 1992 and then moved over to the Counterterrorism Center, where I still continue to work on Afghanistan on and off until... Osama became a, a major issue, and then they let me have a crack at, at finding him. And we found him on 10 different occasions, and Mr. Clinton chose uh, not to uh, uh, use any of those occasions to even try to, to kill him. It, always because they're afraid of, what will the American people think if we try and fail or if we kill the wrong guy? And I always thought, at least from the way I was raised, raised and educated, Americans would say, good try, try it again. But um, American uh, public opinion really consumes them very little. It's what the Washington Post and the New York Times will say if we are unsuccessful. Yeah. Well, you know, it, and the interesting thing about that, I think, as well, is, you know, I feel like for a lot of us from the outside that are just kind of following the news, you know, that they'll look at the government and think that they're making, they're trying to make their decisions based off of 
what's best for the country, which in theory they should be. But it's fascinating when you start, you know, hearing some of these accounts and some of these stories where the people that are making decisions, they're making decisions on what's going to get them reelected. They're making decisions on their political, you know, issues as opposed to, okay, what's the best thing? Like, for example, taking out Osama bin Laden should have been a pretty, pretty big priority. Yeah. But because of politics, that delayed that. Sure. And one of the best examples of that is in October of uh, 2000, when they almost sank the destroyer, the coal in, in Yemen. We knew ex we knew where he was. And uh, we also found out later that some of the muscle for the 9-11 uh, attackers was being trained in his camps at that time. So it was a twofer. We missed twice. We didn't get him and we didn't get some of the guys who were on the 9-11 mission. And why was that? They didn't want to risk a chance of adding any more problems for uh, the vice president who was running for president at the time. Yeah, yeah. Now, now, when, now, when you're dealing with somebody like Osama bin Laden, I mean, I feel like, especially after 9-11, you know, obviously that was a really big focus. But pre-9-11, I mean, he was he was still a pretty big focus on, like you were saying, like, you know, Clinton called off, you know, taking him out, you know, all the way back then. For all of us young millennials that weren't <laughs> that weren't adults, uh, you know, back in the 90s, like, what was it about Osama bin Laden pre 9-11 that was so concerning that you guys were tracking him? His voice and what he said. He was one of those. I always used to kid people and say he would have make, made a great American politician because he stayed on message. From the day we started to look at him in 1992 or three until he died in 2011, the basic uh, message from him was exactly the same. We don't care if your women vote, if they wear short dresses, if you make X-rated movies, if you have democracy. We don't like it, we don't want it for ourselves, but just get the heck out of our area. And instead, uh, uh, under both parties, they preferred to believe he was a fanatic um, who was just uh, uh, not happy unless he was killing. They were very, they were very convinced that people followed him only because he was rich and that there was no role for religion in the modern world. And so, uh, not only not Christians, but Muslims certainly can't be uh, genuine in in uh, uh, announcing their belief in the Almighty. Yeah, well, you know, I think speak, speaking of that as well, I think I think a lot of a lot of what we've seen maybe in part of that is because it's our society has become so secular and so anti-religion in general. But you know, I feel like when we're dealing with things like terrorism and things like Osama bin Laden and those kinds of things, it's it's one of those things where they're they're trying to take that religious aspect out of it and they're just trying to make it seem like they're monsters. So when we're talking about like Islamic terrorism, I mean, obviously, you know, we're looking at that. And it's like, okay, it sure seems like that's a very religious aspect of it. But at what point does the religion play such an important role in what we're seeing in the Middle East? Well, it's certainly when we were chasing Osama bin Laden, it was the primary role because he didn't have enough money to pay these guys enough to keep them in the field. Many of them didn't get paid at all for months at a time, uh, usually a bare subsistence. But I, uh, under the Islamic State... Um, it changed a bit. They attracted more of a, uh, a nominal Muslim uh, group, and they also were able to pay very uh, large amounts of money because they had controlled so much oil and were able to sell it on the black market for so many years because we didn't interfere with them. At one point, the military was told not to attack uh, uh, tank trucks moving oil for the Islamic State because those guys were only trying to make a living for their family. They weren't real terrorists. So when you deal with that kind of thinking, it's very difficult to get uh, one step ahead. Uh, it's, it's, one, it's clearly one step ahead and then two steps back. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, and, and I think the other, the other question that I have kind of going along with that is how prevalent is this kind of extremist mentality within the Islamic community? Because I feel like a lot of people will say it's just a very small number. Other people will blow it out of proportion, make it seem like it's almost everybody. Like, realistically, when you're looking at that, like, how prevalent is this extremist ideology? I think the, the um, prevalence of it is worldwide in the Islamic world, not to pick up a gun and kill somebody, to, but to harbor a very deep resentment against the United States for its um, 
interference in the in the Muslim world. For example, maintaining tyrannies in most of the Arab world and associating with them and allying with them since 1945. Um, our relationship with Israel is always a very strong uh, um, uh, influence on negativity toward the United States. Now, that doesn't mean we have to change anything. The only important thing for us is to understand what the enemy thinks and make the judgment about whether he is sincere. And the correlation between Osama bin Laden's words and deeds was extraordinarily high, 70 or 75 percent. And um, people didn't believe it. I always think, too, that in our society, it's not really a secular society. It's really a society of um, multiple gods. Whether your God is uh, the, the God of Christianity or Christianity or Judaism or Islam, that's one thing. But free trade is a religion. Um, uh, uh, support for sexual deviancy, deviancy is a religion of sorts. People, when they abandon when they abandon God, they always find another one. World government is another, another uh, climate change is another uh, God. And so what we really do is have a clash of, of enormous numbers of uh, uh, foul religions in this country or, or, or unrealistic religions and, and a few very, very clear, uh, genuine ones. Yeah, and, and how, how much do you think that that is really impacting the, the chaos that we're seeing today in the American society as well. I mean, I feel like we haven't, we've never, at least as far as I can tell, we haven't been this polarized and this like, you know, anti each other in quite a long time, if at all, here in America. Like, do you feel like that's a big part of what we're seeing right now? Well, sure. I think the, um, you look at what the Democratic Party supports. And for most of my lifetime, those who disagreed with them acquiesced. And unfortunately, the Republican Party also acquiesced. And with the advent of Mr. Trump and his willingness to call a spade a spade and his uh, beliefs that coincide more closely with uh, genuine religion than the false religions that are out there, uh, it, it emboldened people to say, enough is enough. We've killed 61 million infants. That's plenty. No more. We're tired of a two-tiered system of justice. We're done with that. We're not, uh, if you live in the South, we're not second-class citizens. You're not going to change our history by taking down statues and flags. It, it opened up a whole box of animosities that had been contained for the sake of unity. And now, um, because I think the people who support Trump, and I'm one, see that if it's not done now, it's never going to be done. And the, the government and lifestyle and laws of Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton and the Democratic Party are going to be replace the Constitution and replace the Republic and the rule of law. And so uh, to me, I have no longer any interest in, in, in finding middle ground with those on the left because there is none. It's their way or the highway. And for a long time, as long as they didn't bother certain things, uh, we let it get, we let it go. And it was a mistake. It was a mistake from the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, and I, and I think it's one of those things where, you know, on one hand, there's, there's a big push for, for that middle ground and reaching across the aisle and that sort of thing. But at a certain point, like right now, I, I don't know how you compromise with people that believe the complete opposite. Because I feel like not even a decade ago, it was Republicans and Democrats aren't that far apart. I remember when it was Obama versus McCain. And I remember sitting there watching the debates and I'm like, these guys aren't that different, at least in what they're saying from the stage. And then now it's like polar opposites. I don't know how we're supposed to compromise with that kind of a thing. I still think you had a good point because I think if they could find a war to get into and the president would let them, there would be bipartisan support in both parties. On foreign policy, there's barely a lick of difference between the two of them, if it involves a war. So I, I, I believe you're right, but there's just so many, how many things can you compromise on that are dear to you? Um, and, and it never being enough for the other side. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the Second Amendment now, we have this clown in Virginia who, who is going to seize uh, weapons, our governor, um, who, uh, and, and, and I think what 
his name is Northam, and I think one thing he did was really shut down the silent or break the silence that so many uh, anti-abortionists abided by when he decided when he advocated infanticide, killing the baby after it was born. I think that broke a lot of ice in the on the right side of the political spectrum, and it was enough is enough. Yeah. No, I he, well, he it, never took it back. Never, yeah. you know, it just he said it was like it was a natural thing. Let's just kill this baby here. We'll keep him comfortable till we decide to slit his throat. Yeah, it, it, it's it's insane, and and I think that that's that to me is, is what has been has become so extreme in the political landscape right now is. Even just looking at like the Democratic candidates that that have been running for president, you know, if you look at the entire list of them, I mean, it's like they were all competing to be as far possible left as possible. And I'm looking at that and I'm like, is that really a winning strategy to be going so far left and so far extreme that like literally you're talking about not only abortion up to birth, but now you're talking about, quote unquote, abortion after birth. Like yeah. that's the that's insane that they think that that is an appropriate answer to any kind of question about abortion. You would think for you and I, perhaps it is uh, uh, almost a, a Nazi kind of approach to a problem, but or a Stalinist approach. But I think what it uncovers, what so much of this friction between the two groups of people in the United States or the multiple groups is uh, you have to lay it at the door of the educational system which has been for years uh, more an indoctrinational system than it was education. We teach people to be obedient and not either forthright, self-reliant, or, or, or speaking their minds. And until you reform the educational system at all levels, uh, it, it's, it's, I don't know how we proceed. You know, this, this business on this flu, which is a stronger flu than usual, but still it's not a... Um, yet a disaster. And yet the Democratic Party and its minions in the academy and in the medical field can't do anything but oppose the president and whatever he wants to do. Um, and that, that, to me, just shows a clear unconcern for the average guy working or raising a family. Because the Pelosi's and the Schumer's, they're always going to have the best doctors and the best medicine whenever they want it. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, and, and I think I think that you know, even dealing with this whole coronavirus, you know, thing, you know, you've got the the NBA completely shut down, the NC, all these sporting events. They just announced today that Disneyland's completely shutting down. Like it's it's crazy the kind of reaction that's happening. Yeah. But but at a, but at a certain point, it's like it seems like it's so overblown looking at the the repercussions of what the disease actually is, and that's the fascinating thing to me. Yep. And it's been very obvious that uh, the change that's happened in the United States, because for most of our history, whether it was during our revolution, the Civil War, the World Wars, all the unnecessary wars we've been in, those aside, it was always the elite in this country that felt, uh, they used to call it noblesse oblige, that they had a duty because of their status and their privilege and their wealth to step forward, whether it was in the Civil War or World War I or World War II. Um, even Hollywood, uh, numerous uh, male stars in the 40s joined the Marines or the Air Force right away. Um, Harvard graduates were among the leaders in the revolution and certainly in the infantry and in, in the Civil War. And yet, what do we see today? The, the hard-nosed bankers and the industrialists and the academics, they close shop, run for the hills and, and take their medicine and doctors with them. Um, the, 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 the elite in this country is just co a complete um, uh, clown show in many ways. They're not leaders. They're not, the, they're not a force that's going to put themselves in harm's way and try to steady the country and calm things down. They make it worse. You know, you know, you know Tom Hanks and whatever his wife's name is now have coronavirus. And I, I, to me, you know, well, I hope they get well, but who cares? But they're going to come out and attack the president now for not doing enough. So it's 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 your, your, your question is pertinent and I don't have an answer for it. I don't know how short of force the rift in this country can be um, uh, healed. 
And every opposition we hear to the Second Amendment makes that clearer and clearer, at least to me. Yeah. Even an old walking corpse like Biden yesterday challenging that young man uh, to come outside with him after he just asked a question about what Biden had said about the Second Amendment. Yeah, it's crazy. It's, it is craziness. You can cope with silliness. You can cope with people being over the top, but you can't. It's hard to cope with craziness when there's it gives you no middle ground. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think and I think that that kind of leads in a little bit to like this bias that we're seeing about somebody like Trump. And I think that, you know, this coronavirus fiasco, in my opinion, has really exposed that a lot in the sense of when this first started, one of Trump's first things that he did was let's shut down, you know, travel from China. We're going to shut that down. And everybody is like, oh, that's too much. That's too soon. That's racist. That's bigoted. That's all this kind of stuff. And then, all, and then he starts doing more stuff. And then now the same people that said that was too much are now saying Trump's not doing enough. And so to me, that really showed like they're just opposing everything he does no matter what he does. It's like he takes a, he takes a stance. They just decide we're going to take the opposite one. Yeah. That's he crazy. He could the Red Sea and it'd still be, you know, there's too much water on one side or the other. Yeah. It's a, a phenomenal issue. But when you want to look at if you want to see a living, breathing definition of hate – just look at the people how, uh, uh, on the Democratic side and how they deal with the president. No politeness, no respect for the office, no respect for the rule of law. Um, you know, maybe the one way to avoid, avoid force is to actually take legal action against um, uh, the cities that have, what do they call that? Uh, con- the sanctuary cons- cities? And- sanctuary cities. Yeah. You know, the the Constitution, and I think Article 4, Section 4, says the United States government guarantees a Republican government to every state. Sanctuary cities are a violation of the Supremacy Clause because the government has supreme control over immigration. So they they could do something that with the law in that case. Um, They they could... uh, it, on, a, on a wide field, this the, the business of the people who spied on, on Trump illegally, the intelligence service especially needs to be, um, I would say, purged in the State Department also. But we don't seem to be able to even defend ourselves with our own laws. We can't find an attorney general who, could, who says uh, that FISA request was illegal, you knew it was illegal, and now here I am indicting you and the, and the court will decide where you're going to go. But now they even have to pick states in which to raise their courts because the judges are all biased in one way or another. It's it's if the founders saw it, they would think, my God, we didn't do such a good job here. Yeah. Well, what do you what do you think is really behind the hatred of Trump? Because the interesting thing is and I brought this up to a few different people and there's different theories out there, but it seems like there's there's been more conservative candidates and more conservative presidents in the sense of when sure. they ran, when they ran and you know think their their belief system and their philosophy he's pretty middle ground when it comes to a lot of issues you know especially social issues which are typically the most hot button things and that sort of thing but then he comes along and you've got guys like Rand Paul and Ted Cruz that are way further to the right than Trump is but they don't get nearly the kind of hate that Trump gets no. what is it about Trump that's causing this this level of animosity I, I, a couple of things, I, I think, anyway, and, and who am I to say, but he's a, a man who should be part of the club. The Hollywood uh, Democratic and Republican establishments, uh, uh, you know, he should be a power player and he should be playing the game. But instead, he's uh, actually trying to clean things up in an in a obviously corrupt system. Uh, that's really based on only a hunger for power and greed. But the longer I watch this since he was elected, sir, is there's something that both parties want hidden and they don't want found out. And I don't know what it is. Is it, is it graft? Is it, you know, what was Epstein about? Is it pedophilia? Is it, is it little James, St. James Island? Is it, um, uh, laundering money, sending foreign aid overseas and getting part of it back as campaign contributions or as some sort of a return channel on it. But the f- fanaticism of the hatred and the willingness to hurt the republic and also hurt American citizens, it just says to me, there's something big there 
that I can't see with any clarity, but I sense that they're desperate to hide something. And, uh, you know, whether, is it treason? Is it, is it uh, selling out the country to China or to Russia or to whatever? But what is it? What would you possibly act like such madmen about? Um, when, when an election is only three months away or six months away, rather. Right. But I think really there's there's a lot to be learned. And Trump shows no sign of stopping um, poking at it. And so those people who have things to hide are rightfully, I guess, scared. And the answer is to somehow destroy him yeah. and his family. Yeah, it's it well, it, and th- and that's what's that's what's crazy, I think too. But I, but I, th- I think I think you know, like when I'm looking at a lot of this, and you know, if like as little like conspiratorial in the sense of like it's not as much of like a secret kind of a thing is uh, people on both the left and the right would always they fundraise over the over controversy, right? I, yes. I, my thing is, I think I don't think that either Republicans or Democrats ever wanted to fix the immigration system. They never no. actually wanted to fix these things. They just wanted to be able to campaign on it, right? So yes. as long as they don't fix it, they can keep raising money. And then Trump comes in, he's like, "I'll actually fix the thing," and that's where I think both sides are kind of like, "Well, he can't do that because where are we going to raise our money?" Yeah, that may be well, an aspect of it. You, you always come back to why does somebody come in uh, with a two hundred thousand dollars, maybe total worth? Make 175 a year and leave with 41 million dollars, or close. He's got 150 million dollars. You know, we don't pay attention enough to our own government. I think there's a failing on all citizens, but certainly on my part. That for most of my life, if they just left me alone, that was fine, except on certain issues, whether it was abortion or or unnecessary wars or intervention abroad, things like that. But by not watching, this is what we got. We got these sinecures. Biden was 36 years in the Senate. He can't speak to one issue that he accomplished, except apparently now negative ones, because he'll he'll be uh, apologizing for him like um, uh, the former mayor of New York, Bloomberg. So, you know, I don't know what the answer is, but I think it's coming to a head. Um, If Trump gets reelected, he's got nothing to hold him back anymore. There's not another election ahead. And... uh, Everything you say in his defense, though, especially if you identify a problem coming from the Democrats toward him, they call you a conspiracy theorist. Well, sometimes there are conspiracies. And clearly, uh, Comey, John Brennan, um, probably Obama and Susan uh, Rice, they were all involved in a conspiracy. I I don't think there's any way around that at the moment. But if you say that you're a conspiracy theorist, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, see, see, you know, it, it, it's one of those things where when there's there's so much evidence to that that there is a conspiracy. I think I think one of the things that I think that we can remember too is that the way that the media paints what a conspiracy is is just it's a made up story. When in yeah. re, when in reality, it's it's this subversive trying to actually overthrow or you know, maybe it's even you can't fully prove it, but it's pretty much there. You know, like it's it's not just this fantasy made up story that the media tries to make it out to be. And I think that that's something that we can remember as well. The facts we have so far is clearly treason. There's nothing else to call U.S. citizens who um, enlist the support of a foreign country to defeat either a presidential candidate or overthrow a serving president. There's there's no simpler And in terms of witnesses, the Constitution says you have to have two witnesses. We've got thousands of witnesses to it. (laughs) But it's 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 certainly an unholy mess. And uh, to get out of it, I hope it can be done without force. But, you know, the older I get, maybe it's I'm getting too cranky. But it seems to me there's not no room for there's no middle ground. I think there's less middle ground in this country than there was in the secession winter of 1860-61 because they were right until Fort Sumter was was attacked until a month before senators from both sides were discussing a possible peace program in in, in Washington mm-hmm. and we're nowhere near that now. Right. The talk of bipartisanism is is the president has to say it but he's not had one thing that's come through uh, uh, to his offers. He offered the DACA thing. He offered, you know, uh, infrastructure. Not a chance. For some reason, 
four more years of him scares the heck out of people on the left. And I'm I'm damn interested to find out why. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I, and I think, you know, what's interesting, too, is that like with your background of, you know, working with the CIA and being being involved in that whole aspect of like our government. What's interesting now is like when we're talking about this kind of conspiracy of a lot of these, you know, uh, you know, uh, these leaders, you know, and people like Comey and people like that, that are in the intelligence community that it just it like it sure seems like they're trying to overthrow a president. Sure seems they were trying to knock him off before he even became president. Like and you and you were saying it kind of needs to be, you know, flushed out or totally essentially cleaned out. How 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 is that how is that supposed to actually happen? Because I feel like it's so entrenched with lifelong people. It's like once they're there, how do you even go about getting those people out of there? Well, I think the the indictments is is one of the ways you do it. I've written that on my blog many times, and I've also think that, that you have to really look very seriously at everyone that was hired under Obama's administration for the for the uh, national security apparatus and really take a closer look at them and see if they really have what it takes to be cleared to, to work in that area. You know, that was driven home to me uh, by this so-called whistleblower who turned out to be a, a Confederate of um, Biden and his son. Uh, I don't know if there's any, it's not an American thing to do, but civil service doesn't mean you're immune from your illegal actions or your partisan behavior in a nonpartisan situation. And so um, indictments, uh, really re-examining qualifications of people to get clearances. And um, it's gonna take time, but they haven't even started. We don't even have one yet that's been removed. We've had people quit. We've had them reassigned back to their home organizations, but um, no blood has run. And in terms of, uh, of what needs to be done, a lot of heads have to roll, legally or or by um, firing them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you know, and, and I think, like, just looking at this whole thing as well, you know, like a lot of people, you know, you know will somewhat criticize Trump because, they, you know, they say he was going in to drain the swamp, he hasn't done it, um, and I, you know, and I feel like we all agree, the swamp does need to be drained, but, but I, you know, and at a certain point, some people are defending him and saying, well, you know, it takes time. He's trying to root him out. He's trying to do this thing. Like, do you feel like he's actually in there draining the swamp? Do you feel like he's not taking it seriously enough? Like, what do you think's going on there? I think he's there's an intense amount of uh, resistance in all of the agencies of government, whether it's housing and urban development, whether it's the CIA and the State Department or the FBI. And I think that that does take time. But if you look at some things, and they're, they're not major people, but the number of Democratic uh, city and state officials around the country that have been indicted, convicted, and sent to jail is extraordinary. The work they've begun to do with the apparatus that has been there for 30 years, finally doing against um, um, the kidnapping of children, child abuse. There's a great deal that, that happened after Sessions started that process. So the one, the biggest problem we have is there is no outlet for that kind of news. If you want to see that news, you have to look at uh, the YouTube or listen to or read Twitter and read the attachments to Twitter. Because the president has to, if the president didn't use Twitter, the whole country would be against him because he has no other outlet. And the media no matter what happens, is always on the side of, of uh, his opponents, yeah. even, if, even if they have to lie about it. So I, I think the odds against him being successful are less than they were, but I think, still think they're way over 60%. How do you deal with that? Well, you eventually have to get your own people in place. And I think that was one of the things he allowed himself to be dissuaded of when he came in saying, I have no experience, so I have to have some experience around me. So he gets characters like uh, 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 Kelly from the Marine Corps, who's turned on him now. Uh, a lot of people who, who are just there to protect the establishment of both parties. So uh, Mr. Trump has a lot of, uh, he's, he's got a lot of work to do, but he's kind of, after three years, he must be pretty used to being 
uh, shoveling alone, you know, and, and uh, I hope he keeps doing it. I'm going to vote for him again. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, and, and I think and I think, too, looking at a lot of these things that like like you were saying, Sessions really started that push on dealing with the, you know, sex trafficking and, yeah. you know, kidnapping of children and things like that. Again, it's shocking to me that the media doesn't report that. That like that that in and of itself should be one of the top stories that's, that's consistently going on. Instead, we're talking coronavirus, which I mean, like in the grand scheme of things, is nothing compared to human sex trafficking. Like, no. what what what's what's up with that? <laughs> it's it's the it's the media, which is the agent of the elite protecting the elite. We just had another judge yesterday or the day before again refuse to release papers that indicate who Jeffrey Epstein was uh, providing um, opportunities for pedophilia. Now, what? It, why would you deny that to the public? Because you're protecting the elite somewhere, whether it's politicians, it's bankers, it's uh, people that own Victoria's Secret. I don't know. But as long as the courts are blocking the equal... Uh, application of the law, it's hard to it's hard to get any news out, and when you do get a little bit of news out, it doesn't make it to the to the newspapers and the media. You know, you watch some of these guys on TV, and and they look like liars. They look like they know they're lying, rather, and it just goes on and on and on. So my God, if the president didn't have Twitter, we would we would be up a creek. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, and, and I th- and I think I think too what what's what's crazy about, you know, everything with like Epstein and, you know, Harvey Weinstein is how yeah. entrenched they were with a with a lot of these people and a lot of, you know, the elites. It's crazy how how close they were to everybody. And so again, you start getting into this into this thing where the media is not reporting on it. That's a red flag, number one. But then, what's what's really interesting to me is that I feel like everybody knows these guys are shady. Obviously, they've done illegal activity. They're they're involved with a lot of these things. But then, the only people that seem to really be talking about it are people like Alex Jones or you know people that are following the Q conspiracy theory or different things like that. Nobody in the mainstream, even hardly on Fox News, is really covering this these kinds of things. So then you start getting into how, how do you trust what you see on Infowars? How do you trust what you see on Twitter? How do you trust what you see with the QAnon, you know, you know, phenomenon? Like, how do you trust all these things? Well, you hit, it, it, it's, a, it's a bit more work than the usual citizen has time for because you have to take a wide, I think, a fairly wide um, sampling of what's out there, whether it's Alex or Q or um, Bill Still or uh, all of these people. Everybody has some portion of the truth, but the thing that unites them is they all know something's wrong. And when the media keeps saying, there's nothing there, you know, move along, there's nothing there, you depend on the people who are doing, as you're doing, this kind of independent journalism. And all you can do is take a sampling and make up your own mind, which is not a bad thing. I don't want George Stephanopoulos to tell me anything about how I should work my life or what I should think. So... Um, but it, it does take a little bit of time. Fortunately, I work from home now, and if I get up early enough, I can catch four or five programs in the morning before I work. So uh, I'm, I'm in a, perhaps a little better position than most people. Yeah, yeah. Now, 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 dealing with you know some of those like sources that I, like that like I was saying, you know, guys like Alex Jones or Q or you know whatever it is, like a lot of those guys, like obviously they've got big followings. That you know a lot of people are following them. They're putting out a lot of a lot of good good information and then there's also a lot of controversy and a lot of stuff that people are like there's no way that that's real or that's true or whatever it is and it, like is it do you think that like the everyday americans who maybe don't have the kind of time that you might have to be researching this stuff should they be following these like alternative like media people or like where should like normal people be getting their news well i think i would what i would do if i was starting again i was i would try to watch the people who do the research based on the things that are published by Alex or, or are broadcast by Alex, um, the, the information that Hugh puts out, the references that Trump makes, because I think on the, on the, on the internet, 
on YouTube, there are some very industrious researchers who find things that are have been public for years, but they're UN documents and they're thousands of pages and it you know, no one has really ever looked at them. We've always assumed, for example, that the UN was a good thing for world peace and all of that stuff. I, I don't give a, a nickel for the UN, never did. But we found out more and more that they're involved in these um, uh, plans for a world government, for uh, eugenics, you know, Bill Gates and, and Microsoft. That's all, uh, you know, you hear eugenics and you think of what? You think of the Germans in World War II. So, you, you know, you have to find your knowledge where it is. It's certainly not in the schools. That's the problem. We don't have, I think, a lot of people that get out of schools that outside of the hard sciences, perhaps, that can conduct a lot of their own research. And almost nobody can do a historical analogy to look at, well, what happened in the past? The founders were convinced that the only light, the only candle we had into a dark future was to look at what happened in the past and, dis and, and be able to discern what worked and what never worked. And now we're in a position where we can't even do that. Look at these wars. Intervention in Afghanistan never worked. In Iraq, it never worked. Historically, back to Alexander the Great in terms of Afghanistan. But we don't have kids who can do that kind of thinking because they have no history background. You know, we get we had when I worked, there was a lot of people who thought nothing, nothing after or nothing before the end of the Vietnam War mattered. And if you wanted to say this happened in this country three or four times, it's a symbol of their national character and their attitudes. The policymaker would say that's history. I don't need to know it. And so what do you get? You get disaster. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, 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 but but see, like that's that's the crazy thing to me as well is looking at you know like a lot a lot of conservatives and a lot of, and a lot of libertarians they do pay attention to history and they and, and they keep pointing back to well this happened here this happened here we can't let this happen again and then you've got you know the mainstream and the left that's like no we 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 got to focus on the future you can't focus on the past so how do yeah. we as you know the conservative side that are trying to look at history and say we don't want to repeat world war ii again we don't want to repeat you know the civil war we don't want to repeat all this stuff how do we convey that to let's say our friends or co-workers or you know classmates even that are buying into all this liberal leftist ideology and refuse to look at history like what like what are we supposed to do well i i think first you have to find someone who would listen and then you have to remain calm when you're talking to them and uh explain why uh, say Robert E. Lee is not the devil incarnate they make him out to be. That indeed, at the end of the Civil War, he stopped the army from dispersing into the mountains to fight a guerrilla war for the next how many decades. And he also, uh, when he was the president of um, Washington and Lee College in, in, in um, uh, gosh, in Virginia, Lexington, Virginia, uh, he was the only white man who would go up and kneel for communion at, at the rail with black men. And, he, you know, he did a lot toward reuniting this country. But nowadays, if you have anything to do with slaves, you are a, uh, you, you're beyond the pale. You cannot be rehabilitated or even considered as a, as a human being, let alone a hero. Yeah. Where do we go, from, you know... <laughs> I, I, history has to be taught. It has to be taught, or you just endlessly repeat the same mistake. How many times have we intervened in the Middle East, and how many times have we ever did anything we were going to? Did Iraq democratize the Middle East? Did uh, the invasion of Afghanistan end terrorism and, and heroin production? No. Did invasion of uh, uh, Libya do anything? Uh, it destroyed probably the most modernized country in the Arab world, and also the living standard of, of a good number of Arabs that were higher than any other place in the Muslim world. And now we have civil war. It's, it's uh, if, if you don't look at the, the past, you make terrible mistakes. But it also creates a pliable audience because people can tell you, well, we really need uh, Medicare for all and we can afford it. And no one has the background to say, well, we tried this or they tried that or someone else tried the other thing and it didn't work. It was a disaster. 
So I'm, 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 I was educated as a historian, so I'm a, a bit biased. Yeah. But we'll it always see. surprises me. Yeah, we'll see that that that's that's the the dangerous thing that I f that I feel like we're we're seeing with how how you know ma our mainstream and our uh, media and our education system they're trying to get rid of all the monuments they're trying to get rid of all reference yeah. to the past because so and so either may maybe they owned a slave back in the 1700s or 1800s maybe they did something wrong or they had a, they had a they had they had a bad attitude or something like it it just always seems like there's always something that every single person in the past did wrong so we just have to cancel them we have to eliminate them and any reference to them and i feel like that's really dangerous because it's like how are you supposed to learn right and it always amazes me that i'm supposed to not do something because it offends somebody it, it, I'm, not, I'm not offending them because I've slapped them in the face or spit at them, but I happen to have, uh, 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 you know, uh, the Army of Northern Virginia's battle flag on my bumper or kids wearing a MAGA hat and they get beat up. I, I, usually, the, the, you know, if somebody's offended by something, look the other way. Turn the television off. Don't go to the movie. Don't listen to what I have to say. But I have no respect for anybody just saying, well, I'm offended by this, that, or the other thing, so you have to stop. No, no. <laughs> That's not the way human beings work. Yeah. And if it is, then what you do is build up an animosity and a pressure that has to come out somehow. And if you don't, you know, free speech is the greatest venting tool anyone ever invented to keep a society um, amiable with each other. But once you feel you can't say that, it, and it doesn't go away, you think it, it builds up an enormous amount of anger. And uh, perhaps it, it builds a road to force. I don't know. Yeah. Well, see, see that, that's the interesting thing about, about like me, you know, because living out, living out in California and how, and how far left and progressive and everything is out here. It's like you, you got to be careful, like what you say in public, you know, like you don't know who's around you. It's, it's a totally different way of life living out here than when I, when I grew up out in Arizona, where it was kind of like, you know, if you were Democrat or Republican, it didn't really matter. Everybody kind of got along and you could you participate in some of the debates. Here in California, it's either you're on the left or you're quiet. And I, that, yeah. that's dangerous. Well, I, and I see, you know, we, what we see here in Virginia now is this new government under Northam. That's exactly what they want. They want you to be uh, go along with what they say and don't say anything about what they're doing. Tearing down, you know, they wanted to tear down uh, the huge statues on Monument Boulevard in Richmond to uh, Jackson and Lee. And uh, it's just uh, it's like you're erasing history is what is what the Soviets did. You know, everything it always comes. I always come back to the, the picture of. Uh, during the revolution in 1917 or 18 of Trotsky and Lenin on the same uh, podium. And they eventually got to the point where they had to kill Trotsky, so they killed him, but then all the photographs were fixed, so Trotsky wasn't there anymore. It was just Lenin. Right. And that's where we're going. Yeah. You know, and even I have tremendous advantage, uh, admiration for uh, Rand Paul and his dad. I gave some speeches for uh, his father in 2012 when he was running. But there is a problem that's not unlike the Marxist problem with libertarians. It's there is a manual. And if you run into a problem, whether it's budget, war, you go to the right page, the right paragraph, you can find the right answer. There's not a lot of flexibility. There's virtually none in Marxism. And libertarians sometimes are the same way that they have a lot of trouble building alliances because they're hard over at so many things. You know, mm -hmm. you can be. You can be hard over in the head, but rhetorically, you can be accommodating if the issue at hand doesn't get to be a matter of principle. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. And, and that and that becomes the interesting thing is like as we're coming up to like the election as well, and you know, because like, you know, because the majority of my audience, you know, conservative Christians, you know, and that sort of thing, and there's there's a big debate, you know, even just within Christianity about okay, do we vote our conscience, which means we don't vote for the lesser of two evils, or do we vote for the lesser of two evils? Because like a lot of people within like the conservative Christian evangelical world, they'll look at Trump and say, well, he's not a moral guy. You know, he's had multiple wives, he's said crude things, and, and that sort of thing. So they'll look at him and they'll say, I can't bring myself to vote for him because of my, my conscience kind of a thing, right? But I feel like that's, 
at a certain point, you're kind of looking at looking at it like, well, if you don't vote for the guy, then do you want Bernie Sanders? Do you want Joe Biden? And that's that's the conundrum I feel like a lot of us are in. Well, the deterioration of our politics uh, has been such that you, by not voting, you open the door to evil. If you're if you're a Christian, it seems to me that. If, if it's important to you to stop abortion, you have to, you have to whether it's hold your nose or say some prayers in the, that God will forgive you, but you got to vote for the guy that's going to try to do that. You know, Americans uh, with 61 million dead infants makes Hitler look like a piker, like he was an amateur, that he couldn't, he couldn't handle the issue. And now we have, you know, what do we have? Uh, what is the flag of feminism? It's not more jobs, better jobs. It's abortion. You never hear from them unless there's somebody uh, questions the um, legality or morality uh, of abortion. It's uh, how can you have respect for that kind of a person? I, I can. Even if in my own family, I couldn't. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, in in you know deal, dealing with that issue of abortion again, like when we're looking at this election coming up, you know, we're clearly looking at the Democratic Party, which is hardcore, essentially abortion up to birth or later, and then you've got Trump for all of his flaws. If you want to say that you know he's got a lot of flaws, that's fine, but he's also been probably the most pro-life president that we've had in what he's actually implemented and done and that sort of thing. So to me, you do have kind of a clear-cut choice right there. Oh, I think so. He he went out this year and marched with the March for Life, you know, or at least attended it, the first president ever. And there has to be, uh, for Christians, if you're going to be part of a body politic and you want it to be as close to your ideals or your beliefs, uh, you're going to have to swallow hard sometimes to prevent disaster, to prevent carnage. It's it's just, it's the way life is. It may not be right. And I'm sure there's theological arguments that say you're going to go to hell if you vote for Donald Trump because he talks like a New York guy talks. You know, I think that's part of the problem is a lot of people in the, in the country haven't heard that before very much. But I mean, I, I, I think that if it goes on that way, and one of the problems we have here in Virginia is they're so picky, the, the, the Christians and the evangelicals, that they don't come out to vote. So we keep getting people that are worse and worse and worse. But I think they will, and who am I to say, but some of these Christians who think like that and stay home, when they get to the pearly gates, St. Peter is going to say, why didn't you try to help those unborn children? If, it, if the agent of doing good was someone you thought was odorous, but he was going to do good, why didn't you help him? Maybe I'm wrong. I, I don't have a collar. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll see. Like that, that, but, that, but that is a good way of putting it as well. Because, I mean, you know, like when, when we look at history and we even look at, you know, like let's say we look at, at going back to like when the Reformation happened, right? You had, you had somebody like Martin Luther. Crude guy. Had a, had a lot of major issues there. But evangelicals look up to the guy because he started the Reformation and he took on some of the abuses that were happening at his time. And but at the same time, he was also anti-Semitic. He had he had some serious, you know, character flaws there. So do do we just throw out the baby with the bathwater or do we pick and choose? I like this. I don't like this. And so can we like I just feel like at a certain point in, in America today, it's like we can't separate out good and bad, it's either you're 100% good or you're 100% bad. There's no, like, nuance anywhere. I think that's right. And I think some, to some extent, that kind of attitude comes from a comfortable life. That you feel free uh, to do that and there won't be any cost to it. But what I don't understand about the Christian electorate is they, by, by being, um, cueing that line, if he's a adulterer, if he's divorced, if he's crude, I'm not going to vote for him. A lot of evil has snuck into the tent. And whether it's, uh, you know, making sexual deviancy the new normal or abortion or pedophilia or whatever it is, uh, as long as the vote counts, the vote should be used to defend 
the nation and its population against that, against evil. Yeah. Now, I, 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 I totally yeah. agree with that. And, and, and so I, th- I think, too, like kind of as we're beginning to like wrap up a little bit as well, but I think when we're looking forward at uh, this coming up election and then hopefully the next four years when, if Trump gets reelected, you know, do you think that we're, that it's just going to continue on like this is the new normal of this chaos and divisiveness? Do you think it's going to just continue as long as he's president and after? Or do you feel like the, the election will happen and it'll kind of like people are like can't do anything anymore? No, I don't think they'll ever give up. I think this this goes on until either they, the establishments in both parties and the elite in this country feel like whatever they're hiding is hidden. And no one's going to find out about it. No one's going to know who was working with Epstein or who was profiting off of American foreign policy by getting a rebate from the people overseas. If that's disturbed, if that secret comes out, then I think there's a way to fight it, because even the media can't refuse. It uh, can refuse to stay away from that. That's why I think this thing with Biden is very important. He's clearly been involved in activities that seem to be corrupt. And uh, they've examined the heck out of the president and haven't found a thing. So a turn, turnaround is good play. Yeah. And so I, I think it's time to have a look. Yeah. Well, so, somebody, somebody like Biden, though, you know, what, you know, he, clearly he seems to be losing it. Like, <laughs> you know, he's... Well, isn't, that, isn't that the truth? There, there, there are times I feel badly about how badly I dislike him because it's clear there is a... a I think it's clear. There is a mental... Um, a problem of some kind, but the things he says, the way he treats people, you know, you, you, kindness is fine, except when it encourages that kind of behavior. And that's what he's got. Oh, that's Joe. He's just a forgetful guy. And he just was joking and all of that stuff. I think that that's not right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, you know, like with somebody like Biden, do you like, you know, cause we know, you know, his 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 kids got, you know, crazy connections with, you know, yeah. Ukraine and other organizations. I mean, you kind of got to think that, you know, he's got some something to do with some of that kind of stuff as well. But but it's like why I don't I don't understand why the Democrats were so hardcore about getting somebody like Biden the nomination. Compared to like like a lot of the younger guys, you know, I mean, even like Pete Buttigieg, Tulsi Gabbard, Andrew Yang, like all these guys, it's like new, fresh, you know, faces, that sort of thing. And then it's like, we're going to put all our faith in this guy, Joe yeah. Biden. We're going to put him up against Trump. Well, he's no threat if he's elected. If he's elected, he probably will make very few decisions. The, the Democratic Party will make the decisions for him. And he, he is uh, he's a known commodity. And they have no interest in young people. They have no interest in left-leaning ideas. The Democrats and many of the Republicans have only two interests, money and power. And the, the threat of, uh, of uh, uh, Bernie, of Elizabeth Warren, was there'd be a 49-state victory for Trump. And they would be not only losing power, but they would be on their backs with little, with little uh chance for immediate improvement. So Biden, you know, in my in my back of my mind, there's still Hillary out there. Yeah, she is so unobservant of her surroundings, unperceptive of how people hate her. I think she still thinks that uh, there was some kind of an awful mistake by someone other than her that she lost. And, you know, given that given the kind of uh, clown show that was the Democratic nominees, they might the Democrats might feel they have no other choice. Yeah, no, it's true, and I think I think going along with that as well, uh, we've got, got a question over here uh, coming off of Facebook that go ties right in with that. Which from John Hawkins, he's asking, do you think that the DNC wants Biden in to take Hillary as VP to backdoor her in? My own view is that it's very. My own guess is that it's very likely that Biden is going to get much sicker before the Democratic convention. And that shortly beforehand, he'll announce that he has to leave because of medical reasons. And then the convention has to pick somebody who's um, not Biden. And they're not going to pick Bernie, although he'll have the second number of votes. No one on the rest of the list has a chance. And so almost by default, you go back to the to the uh, team Clinton. Um, 
unless it's it's you pick Bloomberg and and uh, you know Trump would wipe the floor with him in a debate. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, you know, in all reality, looking at all these Democratic nominees, I'm looking at them like, I feel like Trump would wipe the floor with any of them. Like, none of them have that kind of charisma or, like, moral strength to actually go up against him. It's like, they're just going to try to. They're going to put on a show. They're not going to actually be able to take him on. You know, when that when that tribe of people started these debates, I, I what all I could think of was what massive egos somebody like Cory Booker or that woman from California mm -hmm. have to think that they could be president of the United States. You know, who would vote for Elizabeth Warren? Somebody said the other day that she's, to most Americans, it's their, it's the voice of the teacher they hated the most in, uh, in school. And <laughs> it's, that's a pretty fair description. So, I don't know. I hope it's not Hillary, but then again, I'd love to see her get beat again. Yeah, I, I feel. I feel. I feel like uh, at a certain point, those debates would be all the more entertaining, just because it would be, I'm sure, rehashing everything he did, and probably more now that he probably has more information on her yeah. now that he's president. So that that would be fascinating. Oh, he's got the good runner now. Sure. Yeah. Sure. There's, there could be quite a few surprises in those debates. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. So, well, you know, I really, I'm really thankful for you coming on. I thoroughly enjoyed the conversation. We covered a lot of ground, but, it, you know, it, you know, it's crazy just all everything that's happening in the news cycle that it's like mm -hmm. you, we could pull from so many different areas. <laughs> yes. Well, you were very kind to ask me, and I certainly am uh, happy to be at. Uh, Definitely. Well, thank you so much. Now, now, if if anybody wants to like follow you, follow you, or keep up on anything you're doing or working on or anything like that, how can they do that? I have a blog site that's called non-intervention.com. It started out to be pretty much on foreign policy, but now most of the issues that we've talked about uh, are talked about on on that particular site. So, if they're interested in, interested in an old man's ideas, um, that's a place to look. Yeah, definitely. I definitely encourage everybody to to go do that as well. Um, and then uh, for everybody else, it's like that's watching. Uh, I believe next week I'm going off the top of my head, but I believe Tuesday we'll be back at it. Another episode of Conversations with Jeff. Uh, make sure you guys, if you guys want more information, go to gatekeepersonline.com. Uh, follow us on all the socials and that sort of thing as well. And uh, yeah, we shall see you guys next time.